Donald Owens. I'm a writer and producer for the Decades Network, and I am the Special Events Chair for the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences here in Chicago. So welcome. Welcome to the Museum of Broadcast Communications. I'd like to thank them for opening their doors to us. And um, while you're here, uh, they, when you're here again, check out the uh, Saturday Night Live exhibit that's up upstairs on the fourth floor. And that goes for the folks on the stream as well. It's a really impressive exhibit. Um, and it'll, it'll be here until the end of the year. But tonight we're talking about media archiving with our uh, great panel here. Um, during the past 20 years or so, we've seen a number of organizations created here in Chicago designed to salvage our recorded history. And this is a history which is on film and on video and on audio tape. So we have here tonight three of those organizations. And over the next two hours, we're going to meet these important archivists and learn more about their collections and the best practices for preserving these collections and how you can enjoy and become involved with these groups. First, Media Burn Archive, which has been around since 2003. Is that yeah. correct? <laughs> and they've been preserving and archiving a variety of nonfiction video projects. This group now has over 7,000 videos in their collection. And we're going to look at not some of the samples of their work, but how they uh, do their work. So we'll Very look at that right now. <laughs> Good decision. That's one I ever made. I know that. Thank you. Hillary? Come on, we got to go. We're going to lose our lunch break. We decided to come to Kansas City because we haven't been here in a while. It was a good way to get out of Little Rock, but still be um, in Missouri and, and have a controlled setting, which is what we have inside. Um, we have a debate room set up. We've been going through questions, through some practices, through some mock debates, and just um, going back and forth. The room, is, with respect to the podium area, is an exact replica in terms of feet spacing as the podium area is at the debate site in St. Louis. Uh, each of the podiums, three podiums you see here, are about five and a half feet apart. They're about eight and a half feet from the, from the uh, journalist table. There'll be four journalists sitting there, including Jim Blair, the moderator. This, which is stage right, is Ross Perot's podium. Governor Clinton, for the first debate, is in the middle podium, set back about two and a half feet from the others. And President Bush, stage left, at this podium. These podium positions will shift during the course of the three debates, so that each candidate will have each podium position. What is that? The official humidifier. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is that good? Yeah. Is he going to have a humidifier at the uh, No, debate? he had a humidifier during the practice sessions because we were here for so many hours, oh. and we wanted to do everything we could to save his voice. Oh. You can see, we tried to, you know, we had a camera, of course, uh, filming the practice sessions and lights, and we would play back answers on the monitors and then rehearse. Go ahead. Whatever you say. George is bringing it. And only one time. You can only pull it once. Yeah. And it shouldn't be on anything tragic. But, you know, Ross, you just described the Ross and Mr. Bush. Let me tell you how much it We've got half of Hollywood trying to come up with good lines for the debate, uh -huh. um, but the best lines are the ones that come from the heart, the ones that he discovers either in practice or that just occur to him off the top of his head. Okay. Good. Just whatever you want to. Ready? Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Thank you to the people of St. Louis for hosting this debate, because this debate is about you people of St. Louis, St. Paul, and San Antonio, and about you, all the people watching tonight. Your job, your health care, your education, your future is on the line. 15 seconds is perfect. Take it. Paul, the op with him is going to be up in his suite. Uh, it's more or less him alone, and uh, I'll take you up in about five or less than ten minutes. This is not a press avail. This is an op of him preparing for the day. Can I jump in? Oh, shit. No, can I run ahead, please? Lindsay wants to talk. I'll let you know. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Lights, thank you. This debate book is on the cover of the New York Times today. Yeah, it's a team effort, and if it goes well, everyone did their part. So if it doesn't go well, then nobody did their part. Our panelists from Media Burn, Media Burn's founder, Tom Weinberg, and executive director, Sarah Chapman. Next, there's Chicago Film Archives, a regional archive which has preserved thousands of films from the Midwest with items going back to the turn of the 20th century. It was founded by Nancy Watrous, who's here in the audience with, audience with us, founded back in 2003. I think uh, it started with 5,000 films from the Chicago, donated by the Chicago Public Library. And we are going to look at some samples of their work. It's beautiful. I think it's very nice indeed. to people throughout the country. It's just our way of living, our way of life. The people in the streets are me. If you're white, you're right. If you're black, stay back. Michelle Pitts. And then finally, uh, applause is welcome. <laughs> finally, our audio archivist, uh, uh, who've been doing work uh, uh, on the collection of one of Chicago's media legends, the broadcaster, author, and oral historian, Studs Terkel. For 46 years, Studs hosted one of the most outstanding interview programs in broadcast history on WFMT in Chicago interviewing a diverse group of guests during that time. Many of these programs are now being digitized and made available to the public by the Studs Terkel Radio Archive, which was launched in 2016. Here are two samples of those programs, a 1953 interview with blues musician Big Bill Brunzi, and then a 1961 interview with author James Baldwin. Uh, sitting across the mic here for me, in a chair about the same size as mine, while the gentleman differs in size, Big Bill Brunsey, all six foot two of them. Big Bill, probably the great blues singer of our time, one of the great blues artists, and we're going to try to find out what makes Big Bill tick. The guitar you hear in the background is the brother of Big Bill. That's his bosom brother, his guitar there. Bill, how would you describe the blues? What is a blues song? Well, blues really came from the way people live and uh, the way they, some, the, some of them, the way they're treated. And uh, I hope to do some good for the for the for the Amer for the American Negro blues singers. That's what that's the, them the people I want to help because the people like Mary Nelson they don't need no help. Well, you're doing more. And than Billy Eckstein and uh, fellows like them, them people, yeah. and Billy Holiday and Ella Fitzgerald, those, those people they don't need no help. It's, well, it's the blues singers is the one that's. The the one that's getting kicked in the face all the time, you know, because the uh, blues they're trying to look like they're trying to get the real blues out of out of out of, out of, out of circulation. They they're trying to, to get the 
uh, more bop into yeah, it. In other words, you, you feel that the blues, the authentic blues, is being pushed around a lot yeah, in various yeah, the, entertainment you, places. You yeah, mean, you, you, you know, take a fellow like, yeah. uh, like Muddy Water, Smokey Hog, Lightning Hopkins, and uh, John Lee Hooker, and a uh, fellow like uh, Brownie McGee. These uh, are all great blues singers. Now, them fellows, them, I don't say, they're, they're, they're not no greater than the other fellows, mm -hmm. uh, what I mean. You name in, them as in examples. The field. Yeah. But I mean, them yeah. fellows are real blues singers, and they're singing the real blues that, was, uh, that I learned when I, was, when I was a kid. Bessie Smith, of course, the empress of the blues, singing of a disaster, of a flood. Uh, sitting with me, hearing Bessie Smith on this recording, is James Baldwin, brilliant young American writer, but perhaps uh, a more specific description of Mr. Baldwin, uh, since he is one of the rare men in the world who seems to know who he is today, James Baldwin, brilliant young Negro American writer. And as you listen to this, Jim, to this record of Bessie Smith, what's your feeling? It's very hard to describe that feeling. Um, it's a f the first time I ever heard this record was in Europe, and... Um, in a very different, in a very different circumstances than, than I'd ever listened to Bessie in New York. And what struck me was the fact that she was singing, as you say, about a disaster, which had almost killed her, and she had accepted it, and was going be and, and was going beyond it. It's a, um, it's a fantastic kind of understatement in it. It's the way I want to write, you know. When she says, "My house fell down and I can't live there no more," it's a great. It's a great sentence. It's a great, it's a great achievement. The way you want to write, you say. Yeah. I'm looking now at page five of your new book, and it's a remarkable one. Nobody Knows My Name. It's a series of essays, articles, opinions of James Baldwin, more notes of a native son, the subtitle. And on page five, the reason I've chosen the Bessie Smith record, because on page five, you write of your being in Europe. You're in Switzerland. Yes. And you said you came armed with two Bessie Smith records and a typewriter. And I began to try to recreate the life that I had first known as a child, from which I'd spent so many years in flight. And it was Bessie Smith who, through her tone and her cadence, helped me dig back to the way I myself must have spoken when I was little. And I remember the things I had heard and seen and felt. I buried them deep. I had, And here's the part. I had never listened to Bessie Smith in America. In the same way for years, I never touched watermelon. But in Europe, I couldn't reconcile myself. That's Studs Terkel and the Studs Terkel Radio Archive. Let's welcome Archive Director and WFMT Radio Network Executive Producer Tony Macaluso and Archive Director Allison Shine Holmes. So I'd like to start off by asking Tom and Sarah about Media Burn. First of all, what was that clip we shot, that we just saw? It was from the 90s, correct? It was, it was from 1992. And it was during the uh, presidential debate cycle in, um, well, the debate was in St. Louis, the, the rehearsal, the, the prep was in Kansas City. And that's the kind of thing, we were inside with them, kind of following them around for several days. And so it's the kind of thing that, needs, needed, and ought to be preserved because it's not just like the, de the debate or something that's on the news or something that, it's something uh, completely of, of a moment. And it's of a moment produced for a reason and the reason is to be sure, I keep bringing the mic around, but the reason is to be sure to hold on to it for history and for people who are going to study it, whether that's the public or schools or whoever. So Right, and this is something that you produced for yeah. PBS, um, and Tom also is the uh, creator of uh, the uh, WTTW show uh, Image Union and a number of other PBS programs, but it... Media Burn is not just um, your material, obviously. Talk, uh, Sarah, about some of the other items that are in the collection. Um, yeah, so we um, we have a very big Studs Turkle collection. Um, it really complements what they have at the Studs uh, radio archive. We have about 300 hours of video of Studs. Um, which includes documentaries made with Studs, appearances he made on TV shows, um, things like that. Um, 
It's an incredible collection. Um, we also have a lot of sports material, um, especially um, socks and baseball footage, um, Mini Minoso. Um, but um, what else? Also, I mean, just many um, local independent um, video makers in Chicago are represented, have their, their, their work with us. There's a lot of activism, a lot of public housing oriented material. So it's just sort of a range of independent content. Mm -hmm. And it was I right? It's around 7,000 mm -hmm. uh, clip video clips. Yeah. And we're talking raw, edited, everything. Yeah, everything. Right. Okay. And then, Michelle, uh, we, we, we saw a highlight of, of what's in the uh, uh, CFA collection. Talk about o overall how many items are in the collection and, and just the, the wide range of material that, that, that somebody might find in that collection. Well, as you noted, CFA started in 2005, um, or in 2003, and then became incorporated later in 2005. And the foundational collection was the Chicago Public Library collection, which was a lending collection here in the city. Um, and was available for anyone, you know, films on 16 millimeter to check out and screen. And Nancy Watras, our executive director, felt it was extremely important to keep that collection together as a historical record of what was being screened and distributed through the city, the city's public system, essentially. Um, and from that point forward, the archive really grew to include and focus on films that represent the region, so Chicago and the Midwest. And as a regional film archive, we really focus on films that, as I think Tom was saying, to tell these stories that aren't told by the mainstream media. So uh, films that document experiences of everyday people that might be left out of dominant narratives. We do focus on celluloid film, so we have 8mm film, small gauge, home movies, amateur films, documentaries, experimental films, um, films dating back to 1902, 1903, one of those clips you saw in the reel there. Um, what's the, what's the, what's the uh, film from 1902? That is a, it's a pictorial de depiction of the Hiawatha story mm -hmm. on the entry 35. Mm -hmm. um, so we really try to think about the work that we do is rounding out a kind of history of the region through the way where we've represented ourselves on the region. Right. And then Tony and Allison, the Studs Turkle Radio Archive actually starts with Studs himself, who after, after the show went off the air in 1997, he donated his uh, audio clips to the um, Chicago History Museum, and talk about how the the, the process from uh, from from that point on, how it ended up being a project to to digitize all these tapes. I'll pick up the first part and then Allison. So Studs did the radio show from 1952 to 1997 on WFMT. And it's important that he himself used his own archive while he was still doing the show. He would go back in and pull clips from previous interviews. And so that's part of the reason the archive was, was preserved the way that it was. Uh, that he, he himself and some of his staff, people like Lois Baum, Sidney Lewis, uh, really worked with him to keep that archive intact. And when he left WFMT in 1997, the collection moved to the Chicago History Museum, uh, where some efforts were made to make it more publicly accessible. But really the key thing was about a decade ago, the Library of Congress agreed to take on all 5,600 tapes. Uh, they moved to a facility outside of Washington and started the digitizing them. Um, and they're a little past the halfway point now. And then the Chicago History Museum came back to WFMT, specifically the radio network, uh, to, to ask if we could develop a plan to, to make this collection accessible to the world. And so Allison came on board as an archivist. Um, I, part of my job running the radio network is we connect with radio stations and radio producers all around the world. And so began formulating a plan kind of a five-part plan, and it launches in about three months in May. So uh, a big portion of the archive will start to become available. Yeah, and when you say making it available to the world, what do you mean? Through, through uh, online making it available to the world, is that correct? Yeah, through really the five components quickly, a website with, with a lot of with transcriptions and curation divided into categories, um, facilitating creative reuse, we're calling the digital bug house, uh, education programs, curriculum, um, an original podcast that will start this summer, and then different kinds of live events, public events, and especially crossing into different, different genres, so theater or music or museum exhibits, uh, seeing it as a way to complement other things. 
And really what we're aiming to do is to show that this audio archive has a greater level of uh, public engagement that perhaps a lot of audio archives haven't been able to kind of facilitate before. So while he mentioned that we'll have transcripts, what, he, uh, what there will be is an interactive transcript player, so, which will allow the public to share snippets of the transcript via various social um, platforms. In addition, we have... Um, we're working with uh, a company called Hyper Audio, which is a browser-based remixing platform that will allow um, the public and schools, kind of any, even the casual listener, to, uh, to take portions of many different programs and then um, kind of drag and drop selections to create a different remix of the conversation. So for instance, if there was a student that was doing something on poetry, could listen to a number of poets speaking to studs, and then they can create a multifaceted conversation and then turn that into their, their instructor. Right. That, that's interesting because all of the, the groups here, um, they involve the, the, the visitors, the people who use the collections, you have them just repurpose the collection in, in, in a number of the different ways. I want to start with Michelle and talk about some of the different ways you, that visitors can repurpose the, the CFA collection. Yeah, well, we have about 27,000 collection items. We have a huge archive of physical films that are kept in a climate controlled vault and storage space and one of our real missions has been to make those accessible to the public and we do that by digitizing the film so um, by making digital copies available either by transfer or by scan processes we post them on our website so anyone can watch them for free and our website is connected to our database, so visitors can go and explore collections and search by keywords, so they can search things like Chicago in the 1960s and see footage that varies from, you know, documentary protests that took place during the Democratic National Convention to, like, civic uh, kind of booster films and advertising. Um, so. Our website is really kind of our host for making that work available to the public. And then we also have a number of public programs. Our biggest, which is um, taking a kind of international spin this year, is called the Media Mixer, where we invite in local contemporary artists, this time international artists, artists working both in Italy and in Chicago, to do what we call mine the archive. So we give them access to hundreds of digital files as much as they want. Um, they can work with me as a curator on kind of topics of interest. And then they are given license to create a new piece. And that piece is then scored by an audio artist. Really? So we're trying to think about ways to make this material relevant not only to scholars and historians, but also to a younger generation of people who are thinking about media and living in in a very different way. Uh -huh. How many people have participated in the Media Mixer program? It is now in its seventh iteration. So uh -huh. there's four people per year. 32 something. Someone do the math. <laughs> and, they, and these are sc they screened in public settings after. So now where do you do your screenings? So for the Media Mixer, um, our screenings have been at the hideout. This year, our international Media Mixer is taking place in Bergamo, Italy, and at a very large outdoor to be declared later public venue in Chicago in the summer. Um, but they're all, again, on our website, and a couple of last year's films are screening in festivals like the Ann Arbor Film Festival and Onion City, which is a local experimental mm. film festival. And when you talk about audio artists, you, uh, what musicians uh, have you used in the past to help score these films? And, and when you talk about audio artists, it's musicians and, like, audio sound designers who... That's, well, that's wonderful. Right now we're working with Tamika Reed and Alex Inglesian. And in the past, we've worked with um, Deborah Stratman, the Omais, um, I don't know, a bunch of different people. We try to keep it really mixed up every year. So a range of rock artists, Bobby Kahn, experimental musicians. Yeah. Right. Just trying to figure out different ways to kind of support and help out our community. So. Mm -hmm. And then Media Burn does something similar where, where you allow your, your um, visitors and, and uh, uh, viewers the opportunity to sort of repurpose your content. Yeah, um, I think that access and use are like of 
equal importance to us to the preservation. The preservation is fundamental to what we do, but if no one's using it, it's, you know, might as well almost not have happened. So, I mean, a whole variety of different users um, use our stuff. This week we were um, presenting to kids at History Fair, junior high students who use the videos in their projects. Um, you know, whether they're, you know, doing, uh, doing projects on all sorts of things. I, one of the kids was doing one on um, the first gay pride parade in Chicago. Other kids were doing public housing and uh, someone was doing the Americans with Disabilities Act. So the content gets used by a whole variety of ways that way. Um, and then we do like to work with artists um, also. Um, we have been collaborating with 60 Inches um, from Center, a local arts organization, and they have been pairing us with artists um, and having those artists intervene in the collection. Um, so the first one was with these two artists um, who have a production company called On The Real Film. And they were really interested. We were, together we sort of developed a theme of of, of memory and how media sort of mediates our memories. And so they brought their own um, family home movies, um, both um, grandparents' generation, parents' generation, their own. So there was a mix of like Super 8 film as well as like cell phone cameras um, with our footage and um, just combined it in a sort of fascinating, loose, associative way that just sort of. Um, you know, blend, blended um, d many different eras into something just very beautiful. Um, and we're gonna, they're gonna pair us with a new artist this year to do some other unknown thing. But yeah, that type of thing is very important to us. We should go back, if we may, to the question of how did, how did we get to this place? And how did you get to saying, okay, it has to be online or it doesn't exist these days? Well, that's that's where we were when we started. Okay, we we're trying to figure out how, it didn't exist online. Online video did not wasn't happening. So we kind of evolved at the same time in the same way, trying to be develop and kind of, and create, if you will, um, ways that video could be used, the data could be used that it could be shared and so what happened you know long and short what's happened is that I think what Sarah 17 18 million people have uh, gone to media burn to watch one thing or another over the over the past I don't know 10 years right what was the thought process to start media burn because you had your own collection right. um, and then you you know expanded it over a period of time to in involve other people's Donations and, and things that there, there's a you know I, I I don't know if it's a true story of you like diving in dumpsters. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, it was a Channel uh, Nine. It was a WGN, and I was producing a show, and they were wheeling these videotapes, three quarter inch tapes, out the door. We don't have room for them. We, we, we don't. Have, where, where are they going? Dumpster. Okay. Which is a TV staple, it, 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 you know, especially during the tape era. You know, after a period of time, they would tape over, you know, existing raw tapes and use it three or four times and then dump it. Right. Radio stations, too. It was a common media right. solution, mm -hmm. they thought. That's why we dove in and got it. <laughs> and that's why, I mean, that's symbolic, at the very least, of why we do what we do. Um, it happens to be true, too, but it doesn't matter if it's totally true. It is true. But the point is, we have a different sensibility about what to save and what matters over a longer haul than they do. And that's just a fact, you know. So um, I just want to get that across. And a lot of that stuff winds up, of course, online and accessible and with metadata and with, ever, you know, findable, accessible. Okay. And just, you know, to, talk, to go back to your original question a little bit, um, where we really came from was um, Tom's work in um, the guerrilla television movement and in public television and really trying to create a space for alternative voices on television. Can you back up and explain what the guerrilla television movement was? Yeah, so starting in the late 1960s, um, the Sony Portapak um, CV camera became available, which for the first time enabled people to make TV outside of a TV station, outside of a studio. Um, 
um, portable. You could take it, and it, it was capable of making TV. Not It was not just like making a movie. You could broadcast TV with it. Um, so a lot of people like Tom were really idealistic and immediately, like, pounced on these cameras and, and created these video collectives to um, change TV, which didn't exactly happen, but around um, the around 2003 when I met Tom, Tom was sort of formulating this idea that, aha, the internet is going to be that thing that actually lets us all um, communicate widely with each other in a completely democratic way. So when he when he sort of decided to start an archive, it was really with the intention of let's get this all online right away um, so that everyone can use it, which was a radical idea in 2003 before YouTube existed, before anyone was watching video online in any, um, in any real way. So that, that, that spirit has always been fundamental to our, to our way of operating. Mm -hmm. And uh, online obviously is the main way that people can look at your material now. You say, what, 13 million people have viewed? Uh, 17 million, I think, maybe 18 by now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I want to uh, get a little geeky and talk about formats. First with, with you, uh, with Studs. Studs' Studs's tapes go back uh, uh, to 1952. Mm -hmm. um, First of all, what are we talking about when we when we talk about the quarter inch type tapes? Quarter inch tape. Mm -hmm. Okay, it was quarter inch tape from the beginning to the end. Oh yeah, the the station was still recording on tape until fairly late into the '90s. So yes, we've we've got it's it's largely on tape. There were some cassettes made for various uh, people, producers, those who uh, maybe didn't have access to a quarter inch machine. Uh, but largely, he also had a portable tape machine that he would take into the field. So, but largely on the whole, look, that is what the collection is on. Right, he did a, he did a number of uh, audio documentaries, mm -hmm. most notably, uh, This Train, I remember mm -hmm. from 1963 mm -hmm. on the March on Washington, mm -hmm. was a, a famous one. Um, uh, what were the, uh, how was the quality, you, you mentioned Tony about how Studs was his own best archivist, but uh, were, were the, uh, the tapes in pristine condition? No, <laughs> which not necessarily was his fault, um, you know, storage conditions being what they are, and then the, the, the tape um, makeup itself, the, the alchemy behind it also, you know, uh, wasn't the greatest. But, and, and he would often accidentally or not accidentally erase tape. They, always, they often needed to reuse tape. Um, so there are quite a few programs that have a little print through. So you can, you can make out the conversation for the most part. Um, but some of them, we've got a, a great conversation where he's actually being interviewed by Rosary students, which is now Dominican University. Um, and both copies, just n there was, there's not much that can be done. It's not clear. Um, it's often garbled. And that's not due to him, but that's just the degradation of the tape. Oh, he didn't care. <laughs> Tom, Tom was very true, close to you know. Uh, but at the time, you know, and he and he will totally admit it. Like you can hear in conversations where he is clearly saying, "I'm not the most technical." I mean, and then the, uh, that was true, and also probably to um, also kind of put his guests at ease because not every conversation he had was with someone who was comfortable in the spotlight or even knew or even thought that they could have a voice. And so, you know, he kind of played the bumbling guy, you know, often to just, you know, to put the, the teenager at ease or, you know, a cabbie. Well, he didn't put him at ease at all. <laughs> but, um, but so, you know, and just in various situations where it wasn't someone who was used to getting interviewed, who was, you know, used to being in front of a microphone or a camera or things like that. Mm-hmm. And anyway, you, you, we, uh, you mentioned five thousand, over five thousand shows. Mm -hmm. There's fifty-six hundred shows, 5, about nine thousand hours. How many? Uh, they, they're all existing. Every show is existing. No, I don't think so. There's this rumor of uh, what was it? But the fifty-six hundred are what what still remains. Well, so it is remain, but it's not the entire. About seven thousand, seventy-five hundred. Right. On um, but right. But no, not everything. Um, there's a few jazz legend interviews that were rumored to have happened that we just can't, we haven't found. Right, so, right. Unless anyone out of the woodwork happened to <laughs> record them off the radio at the time, then, then we would have a chance. Right. Because the show, did, it, it was always an interview show. It didn't morph into an interview show because I know that he was still doing TV in He had 52. a DJ show. He started doing a music program. Um, so, yeah. But and then it did 
become in, into a, a conversation show. Right. Okay. Yeah, there's really four, four or five different genres. So the, in, the interview or the one-on-one -on -one conversation is the m most common, but there are still music shows, mm -hmm. these documentaries like, like the train program, but there are others like that with Nelson Algren and, and so forth. And then these field recordings that are, exist more in a raw format that were edited than for broadcast, but of studs in China or the Soviet Union or Italy South or Africa. South yeah. Africa uh, that are their own sort of subgenre, I'd say. Mm -hmm. So Michelle, uh, talking about the uh, formats and equipment, uh, I'm sure you encounter uh, many times uh, de severely degraded film. Talk about the, 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 the process that you're involved with in terms of transferring and then talk about some of the challenges with degraded film that you face. There are many challenges, <laughs> but I also feel lucky um, in some ways that we do handle film and not magnetic tape, <laughs> it's inherently a much more stable medium if it's stored properly. So film that's kept in a cool, dry environment will last for you know hundreds of years. So we oftentimes get material that's in really great shape, but sometimes we'll get film that's you know extremely degraded. And the first step that we take is to do a very careful hand inspection of every item that comes into the collection that's done. <clears throat> on a rewind bench, um, the way they did it in the old days, just winding through a film. Um, and then we'll assess the, the kind of condition and quality of the film and figure out what we can do with it. Um, now we're really turning toward trying to digitize. We have an archival Kineta scanner that we use for digitizing materials. Um, What's it called? It's an archival Kineta okay. digital flatbed scanner that mm -hmm. does edge-to-edge um, -edge scans and can do generally around a 2K output and higher, but um, that's what we'll give clients and make for ourselves. Um, but you know, a part of that access, I kind of want to just turn back to Tom's point, is that there is so much labor involved in the physical process of like dealing with the materials themselves. So we have digital representations of them online, but then we have you know 27,000 items sitting in our vault, and um, you know some of it's eight millimeter small gauge film made by you know home movie filmmakers. Some of it's made by amateurs. Some of it's made by professionals. So you might have production elements on 16 millimeter or on 35 millimeter, and all of those require different kinds of processes to deal with. But our, our immediate goal is always to stabilize the physical material. And what do you mean by stabilize? We will do that kind of assessment process and then remove the material from its original container, document that extensively, um, and then rehouse it in an archival container and then put it into an archival vault. Um, and so that's really important in terms of just maintaining the longevity of the material. We, you know, do an annual uh, photochemical preservation. So we still do film to film transfers, which is the most archivally sound, stable way for us to maintain films for years to come. Um, but we can't do that with everything. And so one of the things that we really think about um, is, you know, the importance of these collections and of taking in as much material as we can physically care for as an archive, trying to figure out how to not say no so that these stories that you mentioned, Tom and Sarah, aren't lost because we feel so importantly that, especially right now in the present moment, we don't know what's going to be valuable in the next 20 years. We don't know if that home movie that someone shot at the World's Fair in the 1930s is going to reveal something that's going to be deemed extremely important in the future. So. And that's why you treat everything as of value, correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, Let, let's go back to one thing you said, which is that you do it for clients, which is, of course, what we do, too, and that's part of what, what matters to, to you to use that equipment to do to do it for other people not just not just for you same with us i mean we are able to deal with almost any format of video that exists and so we've set out to do that partly for us but really to match up with people who need that job done and yeah we you know of course we have to charge for it but it it's a it's a service for clients and, and you know I'm not sure how many people totally know about that or know how you 
you know, you do it too. So, how do you get? How do you? How do you uh, uh, attain your collection? How do you get your collection? How do you? Who's got some? <laughs> and that's and that's uh, you. That's how you do it. You you're, you're going out into the community. You're finding things, but you're also going out into the community. Right, correct? and they're finding us too because we aren't just doing home movies very much. We're doing professional, primarily professional work that. Um, if it weren't to be uh, digitized and restored, it would be gone. So that's, a, that's why. And that's so, you know, people know that. People know that the tapes in their closet are not going to last forever. What they don't know a lot of times is what to do about that um, and how to, make it, how to make it work for them. And in what stages, right? You can't do everything if you've got piles and piles, but you've got to make your priorities. And part of what Sarah and we do is to help them uh, find those priorities and deal with them. What are some of the uh, major digitizing projects that you uh, have done in the past year or so, Tom and Sarah? Um, we've been working a lot for the last uh, year on um, a, a film called um, Howard's Inn, You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train. Um, the filmmakers, Deb Ellis and Dennis Mueller, um, they donated that film as well as all of the elements for it. Um, so there's about 100 hours of camera original footage that they shot. Um, interviews with um, Studs Circle, like Studs is like coming up every time, Studs <laughs> Circle with Stoughton Lind, with um, Noam Chomsky, Alice Walker, um, all sorts of activists and historians and thinkers, um, as well as a lot of footage with Howard's and himself um, speaking at events and rallies and teaching. Um, so we've been working to preserve that collection and make it available, and we've been doing some really cool things with it. Um, a class at Skidmore College right now is um, sort of adopting the footage. Each student is taking like a batch, and they're transcribing and, get, and getting to know it really well, and they're going to um, cut their own pieces out of it. And at the end of the semester, there's going to be um, a film festival showcasing all the student work with the goal of showing that, um, like Michelle was saying, that um, in the finished film, there's 20 seconds of Noam Chomsky, but undoubtedly there's tons of other stuff in that footage, um, like that he said, that all sorts of other people said, there's tons of other valuable material in there that just didn't, wasn't, didn't fit the purpose of the film, but for our purposes years later is incredibly valuable and significant. So we hope that this festival will be sort of a first step in showcasing why camera original footage needs to be saved. Who are some of your peers in other cities? And do you, do you deal with them a lot? Do you contact them at all? In, our, in this city, Video Data Bank also is a video. So we're exclusively video archive. They're an exclusively video archive, but they collect video art, and ours is more nonfiction. Um, and Michelle? Yeah. Uh, well, you're one of our peers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we are sure. all peers. All peers. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the projects that we're working on that I'm really excited about is a collaboration with um, Northeast Historic Film Archive, which is a regional mm -hmm. film archive located in Bucksport, Maine and the Center for Lesbian Home Movies. And it's part of a large um, stabilization, access, and you know, digitization grant to make available from CFA's kind of side of things, films by Millie Goldshaw and Joanne Elam. And Millie Goldshaw is one half of the, the Goldshaw advertising team, Morton Millie. Um, they came out of the Institute of Design. They were students of Mahole Naj. Um, so we're working to make that entire collection archivally stabilized and then available digitally, um, as well as films by Joanne Elam, who is an extremely important member of the experimental and documentary film community. Mm -hmm. Your mission, Tony and Allison, is a little different from Media Burn and Chicago Film Archives in that you're, uh, you're directed at, you're, you're focused on one program. Um, what what else are you doing in terms of getting the word out about this this uh, treasure trove of material that you have and and and, and uh, how are you trying to promote it? Well, one thing is because so much of what our organization does is focused on making contemporary radio documentaries and programs on the arts, and we're in dialogue with podcast producers and radio producers around the world, and so trying to to really emphasize what are the elements of what 
Studs in particular was doing, but also other people in, in past decades that have been lost or overlooked or forgotten as far as approaches, ways of having conversations, listening, ways of just using audio. And in particular, I think just talking about culture and politics in a, in a broad and omnivorous way that Studs in particular embodied, this idea of being able to jump from talking about classical music to talking about you know, housing, the healthcare, to poetry, to the blues, um, and flow between all those ideas instead of the, the kind of the hyper-specialization that a lot of media has. And so really trying to put the Studs Archive out there as, among other things, a reminder of what we've lost in a lot of public media um, in the subsequent decades. Mm -hmm. And really what we've done also is partner with such organizations like Media Burn where we do have similar content um, and then talking about it in a national and international level with, you know, fellow audio archivists and, and also we've got um, some pretty deep ties with Chicago Public Library's U Media um, locations and so we, since the inception of the, of the project, we've been working with them and now we're expanding into uh, seven different branches and then also with uh, teachers. And, and letting them know, and, and also kind of activating the community of, of folks that do remember the conversations, who may only remember kind of reruns and not weren't old enough, you know, to be listening on the radio. So reaching out to them, letting them know, hey, did you know, you know, using all of all of our community members, right, to, to have them also spread the word, tell, you know, a couple of friends. Everybody gets excited because there is so much in there. Um, so we really feel like we can kind of go into almost any arena, like Tony was talking about, and then be able to say, look how relevant this is. Look, get, you can get excited about these conversations because they were often very unconventional. And he did leave space for people to talk, and it wasn't canned. It wasn't, you know, reading the same five questions that they had had you know, in St. Louis or in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. So, What are some of the challenges in dealing with this collection? You, we, we were talking before we started the program about, you know, Studs was, uh, he loved music and had a number of musicians on the show from Bob Dylan to Louis Armstrong to Big Bill Brunzi and, uh, you know, all the classic blues artists. So I, are there licensing issues because, you know, you have all these great musicians who performed live on his show? Yes, and, you know, there is no public domain for audio. So, you know, and all of the audio only brought, was brought into a federal um, copyright in 1972, so then there's pre-1972. Um, and so we often, what we have to do is rely on excellent army of interns who um, remove copyrighted content so we could at least make the conversations available, right? And so, and then document that so at least people can maybe understand this is what the song is. And if the, if the copyright landscape can change, then, you know, that would be wonderful because then we can make some of these great recordings available. Oftentimes we've got a great conversation with um, Oscar Peterson where he's really kind of discussing how he creates music and he's He's walking studs through it as he's doing it right then and there. And so, you know, we can kind of push the boundaries with that because he's explaining. He's not just, you know, laying down a tune that we all know and that he's previously recorded. He's kind of giving a master class very quickly in, in how he creates music. So, you know, we kind of, we, we try to do, you know, a risk assessment and see what, what we can do um, or perhaps try to get it into an educational environment where we maybe have a little bit more leeway that we are able to then, you know, they are able to hear kind of the full picture. Tony, uh, um, you're also the uh, executive producer for the uh, WFMT radio network. Are these shows being repurposed for the network or for, or for locally? I, I know I've heard uh, the, the, some of the programs on NPR, on WBEZ. I've heard this train on the, the anniversary of the March on Washington. Are you guys repurposing this material as well? Yeah, one of the things we've been doing over the last couple of months, or the last few years, but particularly the last few months as we lead up to the launch, is just reaching out to podcast producers and radio producers in the U.S., but also internationally. So Radio France, for example, used some of Studs' programs with Simone de Beauvoir for a national broadcast there. Um, but This American Life have, has used audio. But um, maybe the most present part of all that is going to be this new podcast that we'll be creating um, called Bug House Square after Studs' favorite free speech forum, and not too far, just a little ways north of here, where he, sort of he first encountered... This, this, this very democratic exchange of ideas and dissent and soapbox speakers. And, and that program, every, every episode, will pluck something from the archive that feels very contemporary and with 
a really exciting host who we'll be able to talk about soon who that's going to be, but I think she will have a particular knack for, for bringing a very contemporary relevance and making it speak to a younger audience who maybe has never heard of Studs before or a lot of the people that he spoke with. So, and that'll hopefully inspire other people to want to reuse reuse audio as well. And they'll be able to do it just from the platform. Mm. I mean, if, mm. if they want to do that. But yeah, and we've got a healthy relationship, like Tony mentioned, with producers, both nationally and internationally. Um, so we feel that maybe, you know, we can show the world a little bit more and then bring it home. And then hopefully stimulate uh, a lot more use uh, here and within both station and the network. Sounds like they, uh, there's been a great reaction internationally to the archive. What's, what's, what's the overall reaction been? Yeah, internationally, it's been particularly interesting. I mean, we were, I was just in England a couple months ago, and the British Library and the BBC, for example, Stud spent a lot of time there, and we've been talking about the, the notion of how the archive can illustrate things about the, the history of cultural exchange between the United States and England, for example, which is something that, you know, in the present political climate in both countries, um, is, I think, been a little bit forgotten, and, and finding those, those themes and then finding ways to bring them out. So we're going to be part of a festival at the British Library, for example, in September, specifically focusing on, you know, what can be learned from hearing these conversations from the 60s and 70s, you know, people who came here from England and people who Studs interviewed over in the UK at that time. And there's a great recognition for him over there, and there's a great admiration. So that, that these conversations are finally being made available uh, for the public and for radio producers to be able to you know, use to enhance their content and their stories, um, it's been very well received. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to ask everybody about the favorite items that they have in their collection. I know that you have, Tony mentioned uh, Bug House Square. Um, your documentary on studs, uh, studs on a, on a soapbox, right. is part of your collection. Is, is that a favorite of yours? It is, sure. Studs was amazing, and I spent many years with him over lots of different circumstances, and learned from him, and was amazed by him. You know, so sure, that's a good one. Yeah, you, you there are hundreds the, of them. As right. Sarah said, there are about a hundred, two hundred almost videos. About half of which I would say are ones that he and I put together, or maybe a third of them. So there's a lot there. You did an early one with him, an early video uh, documentary with Studs in 74 or 75. What was that? That was called It's a Living, which was really based on Studs' book, Working. And we did two different versions. One was uh, with uh, three people who were in the book, and three people who weren't in the book, and studs, do, talking about what they do all day and how they feel about it. It worked very nicely. And it was at that time that, I mean, that, that, was, that was a new format, in a sense, that studs created to get people to talk about what they care about and what they work and what they care about, what they do, and then to edit it to get the, the nuggets, as, as we all have heard them say, and put them in a in a format that um, would would reach people. So, yeah. What else is the uh, standout material for you in your collection? Well, I mean, there've been lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's 52 hours of the '90s broadcast. Um, Explain what the '90s was. Yeah, the way as, as I'm, as it, you, we saw a clip from the show at the beginning. Right. Uh, well, it was a series that we did. Um, from 89 to 92, really into 93, I think. And there are 52 hours of it, and it was by independent producers from all over the country, really all over the world, and packaged together by us in Chicago and um, shown on PBS stations. And after a while, they were shown on all the PBS stations. Um, and the purpose... I mean, I'm I'm joining one note in a certain way like this, but the purpose is to show people and events and uh, the world in a way that wasn't being done at the time. And so it was people's real voices. It was who they were, what they did, why they did it, and where they, at the place that they were. So... Um, it, it kept going for a while, about four years. A lot of it was political, a lot of it you know, politics, a lot of it was uh, uh, there was some arts, but there was primarily it's nonfiction. 
documentary short pieces that um, people would, oh, you know, that was the concept. The oh concept. Mm -hmm. Sarah, standout material in the collection for you? Um, well, for me, I think one thing that's really important is um, how our body of work um, showcases different people than have always been celebrated in media. So um, we have a lot of work in, in that guerrilla television movement. One of the things that um, was part of it was that a lot of women were able to get involved, women who hadn't really been able to get into film unions or get into um, movie studio production. A lot of women um, picked up port pack cameras in the 70s and made their own content. And one of our, um, one of my favorite collections is the work of this woman, Anda Kors, who was an experimental video maker in Chicago in the 1970s. And um, she had a collective called Videopolis, who was the group that actually officially produced that It's a Living series we were talking about with Studs. And she also um, did a lot of documenting of, of Chicago theater, th storefront theater, um, Second City, things like that. Um, in and the 70s. In the 80s. 70s. And she had been a journalist. And she, um, when she discovered video, she thought that um, video was going to be the way to do what she had wanted to do in journalism, to um, be able to display nuance, to be able to really understand character in a way that the written word couldn't, couldn't do. And, and especially allowing the viewer to see things in a much more unmediated way than through the, the journalist writing it up. Um, so I think having her collection as well as um, there's dozens and dozens of other women like her, like Judy Hoffman. Um, Eleanor Boyer, Jane Veter, um, Barbara Sykes. Um, I'm trying to think. There's, we, we have many, many collections like this of women, and I'm very proud that we have those and, and can share them with the world and sort of allow them to sort of like get a place in the media canon that um, ha they hadn't had before. Michelle, your favorite from the CFA collection. I, I, I know uh, there's uh, uh, who is the woman who uh, did home movie? She did this sort of staged home movies in the 40s and 50s. Margaret Keneally. That's right. I was going to say it's really, I mean, it's hard to pick from so many great films, um, but Margaret Keneally is certainly one of my favorite filmmakers. Yeah, explain who she is and the type of the type of movies that she did. And it's, it's actually a nice way to kind of link to what Sarah is talking about in terms of thinking about the ways in which we try to, to make available and represent these historically underrepresented voices. And she was a filmmaker who was active um, really from the 1940s through the 60s and early 70s. Um, and she was one of the first collections that we got um, in at CFA. And Nancy got to know her a little bit, had the chance to talk to her about her work, and she was really unusual as a female filmmaker. She was an amateur filmmaker, so she was um, extremely well versed with Bullock 16 millimeter cameras, with shooting and editing, and she was the president of the Photographic Society. There were lots of amateur camera clubs at the time where people would get together, make films, and then screen them. Um, and she made some really bizarre and disturbing and funny films <laughs> that we have. Um, one of my favorites is called Mr. E, which might be the one that you're thinking about where a, a, a kind of bored housewife decides to get revenge on her husband um, using a mannequin. Uh, wearing a fedora. A <laughs> absolutely a bizarre film. Mm. Uh, <laughs> she also made a really great film called Chicago City to Sea in 63, which was made as a kind of ad for the Photographic Society's annual convention. And it looks like a typical kind of, you know, City of Chicago film from the 60s. There's like the Art Institute and downtown, people walking, having fun, but then there's like the back end of a tenement building um, juxtaposed with, you know, a statue in Grant Park. Um, and it apparently, as legend goes, was narrated by someone who is a little inebriated <laughs> at night. So, you know, there are many elements that make it a really unique kind of historical document. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Tony and Allison, yeah, there's, a, I mean, a wealth of great material from the Studs Archive. Those all sound great, first of all. And uh, keeping <laughs> on the theme of the, un, the unmediated, I think, I've been, I've been thinking a lot about the Cold War and, and the programs related to that from Russia, but especially programs with kids here in the 60s during the Cold War talking about the bomb. Uh, there's a series of programs of, of kids in Humboldt Park in 1965 where, where Studs was just 
out in Humboldt, out and around Humboldt Park talking to, to kids about b- big issues about, you know, love and drinking and drugs and jobs and Religion. the bomb, mm-hmm. in particular about the atomic bomb and what they would do if they were God and so forth. And I think hearing, you know, 13, 14 year old kids, mostly Latino in Humboldt Park in the 60s, talking about these big global issues. First of all, they're, they're just funny and warm and charming and also heartbreaking and completely unmediated because you have you know, kids who didn't grow up with, with YouTube and all these examples of how, how do you speak and present yourself. And so there's a kind of, there's a kind of uh, un, unself-mediatedness to those that probably will never be possible again because kids growing up today have such a different sense of how they're supposed to talk, I think, in the media. Mm-hmm. Um, catching those is really meaningful. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, there's two conversations that I always came, seem to go back to, and uh, one was with Elsa Knight Thompson, who was kind of Studs' counterpart out in Pacifica, out in KPFK, and there they're, they're talking about their craft, and, and Studs really discusses the art of listening and the art of conversation and how you, you know, you, you, how he prepares and how he gets out of situations that he finds himself in um, if he shouldn't be there and how he will handle that and just, you know, and that's that's the one thing that I always, uh, we always typically start with when we're working with teens, similar to what you were saying, just so they understand that they don't have to have that perfect answer, that there is this notion of a conversation that seems to be lost um, these days and I feel that that's, like, he is very important um, for them to have that freedom. That's something that kind of Studs had with all of his guests, was that freedom for that. And then um, he had this wonderful conversation with Eartha Kitt um, and talking, just her talking about her upbringing and how terrible it was, but she's got such poise when she's talking about all these horrendous things and then talks about, you know, she got to rent out the Taj Mahal and she gets to control these audiences when they kind of maybe get out of line a little bit because of how, and and the difference between a European audience and, and an American audience. And again, I just think those are kind of nuances, you know, that are, that are lost and, and it just kind of represents his style of, of, let let them take the floor. Let them, you know, and how he he does that. So, and I think those are great, mm-hmm. great starting points. Are just some of my favorites. Mm-hmm. This is a variation on the question that I asked um, Allison about um, about uh, issues with uh, rights. Um, some things uh, are, there, are, there, are there some things that you're concerned about uh, 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 putting out there because of rights issues in your collection. Sure. <laughs> I mean, it's important, but, you know, I'm a little bit different than Sarah, and it's a good thing she runs it because I would run rampant. <laughs> <laughs> I think if it's out there, people should be able to hear it, see it, watch it. Um, you know, that gets me in, in a certain amount of trouble at certain times, but, hey, you know. What the hell? Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> well, and I think as a small nonprofit and not part of a large institution like like yours, we we do have the freedom to just sort of say, you know, it's probably going to be fine if we put this online because we are presenting everything in a, in a, the context of being a nonprofit. Um, we're not making any money. We're just trying to show people cool stuff. So if there's stuff that's murky, we tend to err on the side of just try it. I mean, no one's going to – no one has ever sued us for anything. I mean – yeah, so we are on the side of just putting things up if the well, rights are complicated. Well, and if when they want, they have a problem, we don't run it. I mean, we, we can get rid of it. You make the case that it's an yeah, important I mean, educational resource, whether it's formal education or just life education, right? I mean, mm-hmm. especially the snapshot that it provides. Well, when we so when we were launching our website, it was the big thing we were thinking about. Um, we launched in 2006, um, and so we don't we didn't have rights on paper for almost anything you know like tom had the right to show it on the 90s in 1991 but that right didn't extend to the future when the internet existed and we banked on the idea that everyone was going to be happy about it and not to spend years um trying to track down hundreds and hundreds of different people to get permission and just assuming everyone would be happy and we assumed correctly that uh, in general people are totally thrilled that we've saved the material and we've made it available and that people are watching it again so uh, and I assume that the number of stations have contacted you. You've told me about one station that will be left nameless that contacted you about uh, Jane Byrne footage. 
because they didn't have any Jane Byrne footage at all. Jane Byrne, the uh, mayor of Chicago in the late 70s and early 80s. Yeah, I took that call. That was um, while she was still alive, and this this local station was calling because they wanted to put together her advance obit, and they hadn't saved any footage of the person who was mayor for four years of the city of Chicago. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and uh, uh, Michelle, I assume that, uh, that there's a lot of licensing involved with some of your footage. Is, is, that, uh, is that the case where you license your footage out to? For us internally, I would say same thing. Yeah. <laughs> when we take in collections, we like to also get copyright just so we can make them available easily and hassle-free. Um, but we feel like with our collection items, publishing them on the web is just not a problem. For the most part, we do have copyright to everything that you know is in our physical location. In terms of licensing, um, that can become an issue if we don't have copyright. A lot of the filmmakers, for example, that you know donated their collections to CFA might have also donated commercial films or films that they collected that they didn't necessarily have the copyright for. So when we're dealing with materials like that, it's a different, different story. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even the filmmaker or video maker may no longer have copyright to elements within the film that they license from someone else or something like that. Music is another question. <laughs> we'll go on. Well, and, and our challenge is, is that we're essentially a third-party holder of content. The Chicago History Museum owns the content. They have granted us license to make it available, disseminate it, and even handle uh, a licensing structure of the material. So we have to be doubly careful because we answer to essentially two different entities. Yeah, although your, your case is different because you gave them the, or studs through, uh, WFMT through studs gave them the material. Yes, them. but you know, as it stands, we still have to defer to them uh, and, and how, and then they're, they've been great. So, but we still have to, you know, be check our, our, f our facts often. <laughs> and we're still in an early stage, unlike, unlike the two of you. You know, the archive hasn't even formally launched yet. Uh, we also are working really closely with the great folks of Studs Estate. So there's, there's many, a couple of close colleagues of Studs and, and others who are managing his estate and starting to talk to some of the estates of other people who Studs interviewed too. So we have that direct access to, to, to some key people too that will help, I think, as we figure out the way forward. Mm -hmm. So you have to contact everybody that he's interviewed? No. Okay. No, no. <laughs> but, but in certain cases, that we, we, we worked at a project that used studs of Mahalia Jackson uh, at Carnegie Hall last month, and we, there was communication with Mahalia Jackson's estate through the outside arts organization that was commissioning this new piece of music that used studs in Mahalia. So in that instance, there was communication, uh, not so much through us, but we were able to help point people in the right direction in order to, to get that cleared. Yeah. So grants are a big part of what you all have to deal with. Can you talk about that process and who, who uh, are some of your major funders? It's been a big, process, a big part of the process <laughs> since the beginning, and it keeps on going. Um, and there are relatively fewer p sources than there were, what, uh, to 10 years ago, eight years ago, uh, for... Uh, for preserving doc, uh, for preserving video, I, um, so I can. I mean, we can go on and on. I, one thing, I don't know what your plan is, but I'm I'm curious. Yeah, we'll we'll get to the audience. Plan. Yeah, we'll get to the audience okay. in a second. <laughs> Um, yeah, one, one thing, so, I mean, I think we all probably have a similar list of funders. Um, one thing that we've been talking about, I think, in our sector that I've been talking with other archivists is that over the last 10 years or so, it's become a priority among government and foundation funders to fund digitization, that you can get funds to digitize your content, your film, your video, your audio, but after you've digitized it, there's, there's no funding to continue to maintain it. Whereas where um, once you have these digital files, it actually is much more labor intensive to maintain them in the long term. Um, I hope we talk f further about like the risks that everyone's collections are facing because people's videotape collections are facing a great immediate risk, but their digital collections face an ongoing continual risk if they're not maintained. And there is just really no funding for that currently. It's not yet a priority for funders. So it's it, they give you the one-time funding and then just expect you to be able to 
maintain hard drives or LTO tapes indefinitely without any new funding. Hmm. And that's probably common between all yeah. of our formats. Like yeah. once it, it, that's not just a, a video right. or film or audio. That's just all digital files have have that are at that risk. And because it's such a young format. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Um, we're going to uh, have the audience uh, ask questions in a minute, but at first, I, if the panelists, you, I mean, you guys all know each other and, and run in the same circles. Do you guys have questions about each other's work? <laughs> <laughs> I've got loads for Sarah, but that's mostly for, like, collaborations and, and, and future partnerships and events because, you know, as you can tell, our, our content um, overlaps really well, and so we're just kind of, like, natural fits. Right. Um, have you worked together? Anybody? Yes, they allowed us to um, use quite a bit of the Studs Trickle collection they had uh, in our U Media programs with Chicago Public Library, and then, um, and then the hopefully a bunch of stuff I'm going to rope them into in the next year. Very good. <laughs> yeah, there's been a lot of, and I'm actually on the board of Media Burns, so full disclosure there, and and we should start working together on, on finding connections. And yeah. I've I've worked with CFA before um, in in a different capacity, so um, not. In, I didn't know Michelle as well, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but yes, hopefully there'll, there'll be more for that in the future. Yeah, yeah and we're very complementary, informed in the mm -hmm. same, you know, at the same time and face the same issues mm -hmm. in terms right. of, you know, trying to make our work as accessible as possible and you know, returning to that question of grants and funding, finding a really similar kind of lack of understanding, I mm -hmm. think, that has shifted over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. that, for us, it's a front end and a back end question. So a lot of grants provide are about providing access and digitizing the material and getting it up online, which is fantastic. We all want to do that, mm -hmm. but for us, as you know, a film archive, in order to do that, we have to physically inspect all of the films, rehouse them, put them in a safe physical environment, mm -hmm. um, and then, as Sarah was saying, after all of that work is done, figure out how to digitally. I mean, how to maintain all of these digital assets that require constant upkeep, mm -hmm. and that's extraordinarily expensive. It's territory that, you know, is kind of unknown, really, at this point, um, and that requires an incredible amount of investment in terms of both just kind of education as well as funding, and that's where I think we face our greatest challenges. Right, investment in staff as well, and then the, the facility. Talk, talk about the uh, CFA facility, which is in Pilsen, I believe? Yes, we're in Pilsen in Chinatown, kind of in between the two, and we're, again, independent, not-for-profits, and we've been in a warehouse building there. Climate controlled. Yes, so we have a vault space and a workspace, so we don't have to work in the climate controlled vault. Mm -hmm. We did, formerly. It was great. It was really cold. Right. <laughs> I just have to add one thing about funding is for the Studs Turkle Archive, three quarters of the funding have, has come from the federal government, which is important to, to note. Uh, between the Library of Congress, which is pro bono in kind, but totally critical, that's the digitizing, and then the National Endowment for the Humanities. So we've also gotten individual and local grants and a Kickstarter, which I don't have any desire to repeat. It was successful, but but agonizing. But so the, the role of the federal government in, in making this possible, I think, is really um, critical. And it makes me, we, we certainly are very aware that down the road that that, that, that willingness or those, that capacity for the federal government to support these kinds of projects uh, may, may diminish. Right. Yeah, in a way, you're luckier than, than these folks here because you have that, the, the Library of Congress and the federal funding that, that they, they don't have. Yeah. And I know it's a constant challenge for Tom and Sarah and Michelle to to uh, to to fundraise um, and that on your websites you do have uh, you have a, 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 a donate page so when you visit their websites make sure that you donate okay do you have a subscription service too um no okay I don't know how to say the word so that's why I can't say it <laughs> no we were gonna do we try we tried oh, okay. that and then we gave it up All right. So. But um, yes, we do rely on a lot of individual donations. Um, I was going to also say that with regard to what Michelle said, um, one thing that I think a lot about is the long-term survival of like our digital heritage. That right now, all of us, what we do is we're able to collect 
objects that people shot and then they stored for decades and they kept them just in a closet or whatever and they lasted for several decades and then we're able to get them now but right now we're all shooting things on our cell phones all the time and we just have all of these files and I just I I wonder what our children and grandchildren are going to be able to know about this era how much any of this material is going to survive because I don't think any of us probably have long-term plans for for maintaining all of our photographs and videos that we're taking on a daily basis right and the other challenge that you have is that that the video format is not a, it, it, it doesn't have the lifespan that, it, that film has, correct? Right. Um, yeah, that's one thing I, I wanted to say earlier is that if you if you have videotapes, if you produced work on video or have home movies, um, videotape is at the end of its lifespan now. Um, there's like been 15 estimates. Year, 10, 15 years? Yeah, there's been estimates as dire as starting around 2023, it'll be pretty impossible to um, get your tapes transferred. Um, the, the tapes themselves um, deteriorate very quickly and they're unrecoverable once, once they deteriorate. You can't really bring them back with a photochemical process like film. There's nothing you can do. You need to transfer them. Um, and you need to then make sure that those digital files last because you will not be able to play the tapes back. Um, in two decades. And, and the, the other thing is the equipment. The equipment is not going to last. Parts break. You can't get new parts. No one's making them. Um, and there were 20 or so different video formats, unlike film, where there's just a free, you know. Mm -hmm. um, there are many, many different kinds of videos out there, and people really need to deal with their collections now while they can, still can transfer them. Right. And with audio, it's just one basic format that you're dealing with. Uh, we'd like to think that, Three. but that's not often the case. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but also, and in, in speaking to what you were both talking about, you know, we often have to rely on open source uh, software and, and, and a community that will then create tools to help monitor our digital file health and to maintain that integrity. And, you know, if we're not, not all of us are very tech savvy, I mean, I couldn't code for my life. So, you know, we have to rely and support them and the tools that they make and their partnerships so we can help them you know help us and and make in maintaining that 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 file integrity because we are in totally uncharted territory because there is some documentation at least about videotape and and the degradation and what you can and can't do but you know we are you know well, and the other thing is that, for especially I just I thinking about for individuals whose work is not in an archive, it's really like assuming you have a lot of like skill and information that you're going to be able to maintain your digital files. Like with your your films, your audio, your video, you've got a lot of leeway. If you leave it and it deteriorates, you're maybe going to get a bad transfer right. of a video or or something. Yep. But if you have a hard drive that's full of, you know, hundreds of hours of content that you shot and the hard drive stops working, you don't have any of it. You just got none of it. It's all gone in an instant. And you're not going to have just like a partial staticky transfer. You're just going to have nothing. Mm -hmm. We'd like to open it up to the audience for questions. Uh, we don't have a microphone for the audience. So what, what you'll have to do is just uh, state your question and then I'll repeat it to the panel. And uh, you, sir. Uh, the phrase risk assessment was mentioned. I have a YouTube channel I've been doing for the last five years with recorded broadcasts from Chicago TV going back to 1979 on Betamax and like old commercials, political clips, uh, sports clips. And, and it seems like this is a, a gray area that a lot of us are doing. And a lot of it is, is like wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Because by letter of the law, of course, I have no right to upload a Johnny Morris sports clip talking about concussions with Mike Ditka from 1983. On the other hand, 50,000 people end up looking at it because mm -hmm. Huffington Post chose to point at it. Mm -hmm. so, so it's interesting because it runs the whole gamut from whoever originally produced that doing nothing about it to saying, how dare you take that down on copyright strike to the other end of the spectrum, which is, thank you so much. We don't have this. Where did you get this? Like the people who produced it in the first place before it preceded uh, digitization. digitizing. Mm -hmm. So I've gotten, uh, on a not infrequent basis, like, Thank you emails saying, what else do you have? You know, thank you so much, but I don't really own that. So mm -hmm. I'm being thanked for committing this crime. It's, it's, it's very strange. <laughs> so basically your question is, a, it's, a, it's a rights issue question. What, what, can, you, uh, what can you post? It's, and, it's a roll of the dice. Right. A, am I going to have my channel taken down because I have three copyright strikes in six months? Or am I going to receive all these, uh, you know, mm -hmm. accolades for, for sharing historical stuff that nobody has? Mm -hmm. So what's the, what's the thought process in terms of posting something that you may not have rights to? And how do you, well, how do you respond to that? How long have you been doing it? Since 2012. 
And have you been busted much? Well, I, I got a, a couple of copyright strikes, but then I just hope that it won't be three within six months because then the channel's taken down. And then when, you, when it happens, then you just take it down. I mean, that's... Oh, they no, they remove the YouTube. content. Right. Yeah. Or they remove it. For, yeah. Either they contact you and have you remove it, or they remove it themselves. They remove it, plus they do a one strike towards a three strikes, you're out. Oh. Well, I think YouTube is, a, is like not... YouTube is not a free forum for everything. I mean, yeah. YouTube is its own universe with their own rules that plan. are going to constantly change. And I think that what is generally okay to put online may have, I mean, when YouTube is overseeing it, they have their, their own rules. Um, interestingly, we've found that YouTube has gotten a lot more, I was talking about this just the, um, last week with the guy who runs Witness, which is a uh, human rights video organization. And we were talking about how um, YouTube has become really conscious in the last six months or so about the way that advertisers are impacted by content. Um, and I was looking through just the other day, about half of the content on our YouTube channel is no longer monetized because um, they don't monetize content that is political or um, potentially controversial anymore. That's interesting. I mean, but, but that's a big change. It's mm -hmm. a major change. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. a major change. Um, so YouTube just isn't like a free it may not forum. be the best platform, I mean, even though. You may want to switch yeah. to something else. And there, I mean, there are other options as well. Yeah, like you're saying, just one of many platforms. Yeah. And we had a really interesting experience with YouTube recently where an experimental film that was made by Robert Stiegler, who came through Institute of Design, um, you know, filmmaker in the 1960s, like crazy editing together, all sorts of different material, used a snippet of a film, or of a song by the Beatles. And to oh, get yeah. back to music, the Beatles being notoriously litigious, that was flagged by YouTube's algorithm. And we were sent that notice that you probably received. Oh, yeah, we've got um, so that's a dozens of those. <laughs> for us, clearly constitutes like fair use um, and you know a creative interpretation of that material on our website, but might not be supported on a channel that's highly commercialized like YouTube. What are the other plat platforms that you guys use besides YouTube? Vimeo. Mm -hmm. Because the concept of fair use doesn't exist on YouTube. That's like a legal designation. It's exactly. not a YouTube designation. Exactly. And, and that's what I was going to say. If, if, you know, your best case for doing that is to frame, and it takes a lot of work. It's not easy to, to frame the videos in, in, in a larger context, in a larger conversation, so that while the video is the main focus, because that's the whole point. But if you can kind of shape a conversation around it, then um, you've got more of a leg to stand on. Then um, you know you, you've got something to maybe fight back a little bit with if you've got that. But it takes a lot of work um, to do. But that might lessen. You know, if you're getting close, then maybe you know try to frame them that way, and and they they may hopefully you know back off a little bit. But if enough people kind of revolt and do this, then hopefully, I mean, that's how we're going to hope, you know, somehow enact some kind of change. I mean, we've got a new librarian of Congress. She is soliciting um, questions and, and feelers from media organizations around the notion of copyright and how it should be changed. But that's not going to happen overnight. So, um, but so using what we do have, which is this notion of fair use, might be able to help out a little bit. And in the meantime, saving TV is always a good idea. I was in a TV station a month ago, and there was a sign on this, shelf, this wall of shelves that said, warning, do not throw away tapes until they have been aired. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Um, this is another rights fair use question. Um, for someone who's sourcing videos from databases like yours as well as from um, in instances where they may have copyright cleared but not necessarily given you rights to license, do you save that information so that whoever is trying to license that footage can actually go back and find the contributor and speak with them directly in terms of trying to license that footage? It's if, if in lives, general, if yes, it's an individual lives. case. I mean, I'm not yeah. sure what you're talking about. Um, well, yeah, we generally, uh, both of us work for a company that writes corporate histories. And multimedia, so what we do is we do you know, digital content, we do uh, exhibits, books, videos, things like that. So if we're trying to find archival footage, it'll be mostly used in an editorial sense, but obviously since it's corporate, you have to go through the legal departments and kind of tick all the boxes and make sure everything is 
is cleared for fair use. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, it, it totally depends what type of company we're working on. But. Well, I don't. I mean, uh, there's lots of con there's lots of context. You know this yeah, better than we. Um, but there are there are times when they will tell you you can't. When in fact, I think there's a good argument to be made that it's fair use. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that doesn't get you anywhere if you're in trouble already. Right, yeah, it's like, well, he said so. <laughs> but yeah, I think both of our archives are small enough where it's easy for us to, we, we tend to have personal relationships with the filmmakers, um, so we, we can talk to them if need to. Yeah, and for us, you know, if we don't have the copyright, we generally know where to point people in the right direction, yeah. so we can connect you with a relative or someone who would mm -hmm. be able to assist you. Yeah. Yes, sir. I have a question about dumpster diving. <laughs> <laughs> a dumpster diving question. Peter, you? Well, and I, have, I actually have two, issue, two uh, instances that a lot of people don't know about. One is Michelle. I, I'd always heard that the, the, the library films, the 16 millimeter films, were in a dumpster, and Nancy Watkins walked by and said, Why can I have it? Is that not true? Nancy, what do you want to say? <laughs> I mean, I, I think they, they, they were getting ready to throw them out. So they would have been... They would have been there, but they didn't they would have been there. there. But I will say from personal experience, plenty of libraries did actually just stack their films up outside on the sidewalk. Um, but in the specific case of CPL, Nancy, you were... I, I, think, um, I think they had tested, the library had tested with the water too films in the dumpster. I think Jim Finn actually was an experimental filmmaker made a big stink about that because and, and so he brought this whole issue about this valuable collection that needs to be saved. And I think the library totally attracted any thought of throwing it away. But then in a sense so uh, uh, CFA uh, started from the dumpster too, but to get more to my point, uh, there was in 1970, I believe, that GTW produced what's sort of known as the first black drama on TV. Bird of the Iron Those were on their way, out, literally on their way out to the dumpster when a friend of ours, uh, maybe a friend of ours, or Shun Nguyen, a woman of color, who worked in master control at uh, a WTW at the time said, wait, I know what those are. And only a couple were saved. Mm -hmm. um, but, so pay attention. Mm -hmm. I received a phone call from a producer at WBEZ, Anna Contreras, recently, and they had given her a, a cardboard box that had come in the mail just to WBEZ. And it was full of quarter inch audio. Real to, well, obviously, real to real, don't they say. Uh, and she, I, she, they, she thought that maybe they were from films. And I'm a filmmaker that she knows, so she called me. And in fact, some of my material was in there. I believe <clears throat> that it's uh, from your collection of the film group. I believe uh, that it's audio tapes of all of the Young Lord's material that hmm. never made it into either The Murder of Fred Hampton or uh, American Revolution II. These are two films that mm -hmm. I have the Chicago Film Archives. Uh, I've, I've heard some of it. Um, uh, I haven't seen it yet, but I'll keep you guys posted. Do you know who said it to that No, if they can't, well, I know a little bit. I, I'm, I, don't, I haven't heard who the person was. But it was a dumpster diver. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the importance of dumpster diving. And no archivist and no media archivist hasn't had that experience. I mean, you know, because uh, oftentimes companies, they don't see that and they don't understand their cultural heritage and what they're throwing away. And so it's kind of up to us to, to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the important stories that goes kind of untold with video, and you can tell this much better than I can, is like I think back to what it was like when you know I was growing up and recording shows on VHS tape, 
Mm -hmm. um, and I would just record and re-record and re-record mm -hmm. and re-record, mm -hmm. and that's what television stations were doing right. as well. They right. were reusing that material. So there's so much lost material that we really re rely on these like sources and mm -hmm. people who are sending things in or dropping things off or you know making anonymous <laughs> donations <laughs> or recording things at home sometimes yeah. um, to be the kind of people who save that history. Right, and that's and that's important. That's and that's really the theme of this seminar is that these are all people who are uh, rescuing our cultural heritage and they should be applauded for that. So. Um, thank you. Um, any other questions from the audience? Yes, sir. I'm not exactly certain how to put this into a question, but I'm, I'm really interested in the library sciences of what you do. I mean, uh, they've been searched a lot of stockhouses, including some of yours. Sometimes it's very hard to figure out how to search them. Um, have you, do you spend a lot of time developing databases, developing cross-referencing? That, that's the part of it I find so challenging. I've, Work with companies that have huge archives of stuff. They've got them archived in some fashion, but you don't. It's some, but there has to be institutional knowledge. There has to be somebody who's been there forever who says, "Oh, that'll be um, at aisle three. Um, are you continually developing ways of, uh, of, of, of description? Database, a search system for these. Like description. I know I am. I'm sure yeah, you, I mean, you I are think, too. I think all of us, that doesn't that's stop like the ever. majority of our work, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we're constantly thinking about that. I mean, I worked for an organization that had gotten funding for um, a particular type of, of description that is, you know, up to archival standards that did not fit the pe serve the people who were going to use the material. And, and I took that knowledge and brought that into how we describe and make available the, the Studs Trickle Radio Archive because I don't, we don't need a highly academic described source because that's not necessarily who's looking for our material and those that are of the academic side know Studs enough that they understand that that's not what he was about. So why would we try to describe and make that available in that way. Um, and not all institutions have that ability. We do because we're smaller. We don't necessarily need to adhere to any kind of, I mean, we adhere all to, to standards and descriptive standards, but we can push those a little bit so that it can be more beneficial for someone who isn't you know, going to a university archives and, and adept to that, that search mechanism. Yeah. as well as new footage and put it all together. Mm -hmm. The commercial vendors, very sort of nonsensical, just loose, get yeah. It. yeah. Con five, whatever you get is what you get. Uh, and then historical people can go all the way from the same sort of thing to overwhelming you with all the different search terms. It makes it impossible to find what you're looking for. We were talking about technology of the file format being the real demon but I think you're also sort of looking at a search conundrum here. Exactly, you know, like if there's, there, there, I'm not saying that there's going to be a universal way, you know, and saying what you said about the Turkle collection is great, but primarily for the Turkle collection. Oh, absolutely. You know? It's all local practice. You really need to understand who you're serving. It's right. not one is going, I mean, clearly not one is going to work, but you need to understand, we need to understand who our major user base is, and then also sometimes descriptive standards are dictated by funding. Well, your colleagues are going to face the same problem, but each in their own individual Oh, absolutely. Ways. But then that raises the other question, do we have this battle of search method methodologies that we're all trying to negotiate as filmmakers as we try to get it? into your stuff and keep it from being solipsistic. Mm -hmm. You know, like how many different search languages do we need to know our search protocols do we need to master in order to make most of what you guys are doing? And I think we probably try to adhere to the normal, uh, the norm standards that are happening now with like how you would search Google and how you would do Boolean searches. I, I mean, I think we are trying to catch up with what people are familiar, most familiar with 
in a rapidly changing technological environment where searching has been so stagnant and it was just on paper. I mean, now there's control F. There wasn't always that before, you know, which isn't the end all be all, but I think it's just something that we all struggle with and, and who can we serve? And, you know, it's always, I, I always ask, ask the archivist because we'll, we'll, we'll answer, you know, and try to help. I mean, this is, that's our job, you know, to making it accessible and to get it into your hands. Yeah, I mean, for us, the process of describing the material takes at least as long as digitizing, <laughs> if not more. Because, yeah. and, but if you don't describe it thoroughly, no one ever, besides that person who saw it when they digitize it, no one is ever going to use it because if they don't, they don't know what's in it. I mean, you, we describe everything on a shot by shot basis, just because people in general, most people aren't going to watch our entire things. They're, they might want little bits of each thing, and yeah. Let's say, let's say, that's that very, was uh, the beginning. I mean, that was a premise that we, we built it. No, I'm serious. It wasn't, it wasn't because we knew 18 different search languages. It's because you take, you take what you, what's there, you put it out there in, in, in the metadata in any way you can, tags and this and that, and, and the words and, you know, soon pictures, I assume, and sometimes it is. Um, but... It's not going to work to force people to learn languages because it ain't it, it it's over. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yes, sir. I'm sorry. One more. I want to address a, another monster known, probably to you, John. My name is Peter, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, South Side Home Movies. Mm -hmm. um, the Black Metropolis Research Consortium. And I believe at Columbia College is a black music. The Center for Black Music Research? Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you, are, is there a reason they're not here? Are they, I don't know that much about them, and, but I'm just wondering if they were invited and didn't come. They were not invited, and you're absolutely correct. They should be here. You're absolutely correct. I'm, very, I'm personally very interested in uh, South Side Home movies. Mm -hmm. uh, I work. I work with uh, uh, an early uh, uh, user of, of the Portapex, the community TV network, mm -hmm. who has a, a, a remarkable half-inch reel-to-reel video collection, um, uh, mainly out of Humboldt Park. So I'm very interested in studs this. Uh, but we have been talking to Southside uh, uh, Home Movies about these are, these are kids uh, making, kids in Humble Park making videos about themselves. So they're essentially home movies, even though they're edited in the shows. And uh, Southside Home Movies and Community TV Network are talking about a, uh, uh, you know, a, a show together. That's what I'm getting at. So I'm one, and I don't know too much about them. Do any of you guys know? What they do, I imagine they have... Yeah, I think we know them. Not on yeah. the Chicago <laughs> Film Archives, yeah. where you can bring your own movies in. Yeah, a very small community. So we work really closely with the Chicago Home Movie Project, um, or the Southside Home Movie Project, excuse me. And they do really important work in collecting, especially amateur and home movies, as you're saying, and work that, you know, is necessary to be done. Um, but we're also excluding the whole kind of like west side of Chicago, mm. other suburbs. I mean, there are so many communities that we have yet to reach out to. And one of the things that we kind of really want to push towards and for in the future is bringing events like our home movie day event in which people can just show up with home movies. Um, out into communities that are underserved and aren't in the, the center of the city of Chicago. Um, but you raise a really important point that there are these, you know, incredible archives of material that just aren't available and aren't represented. And I know, Michelle, you've, you've started doing that with home movies. I know that you had partnered with Theaster Gates um, a, a few years ago with uh, 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 a home movies night uh, at his, uh, at his uh, studio on 70th and Dorchester. Is that correct, Nancy? I mean, they, they kind of are partners with us in 
and a lot of stuff. We haven't, um, Southside Home Movies is, is something that Jackie, Jacqueline Stewart has been heading up um, for a number of years. And is, and she's also worked with the Astro Bates, you know, on the Black Cinema House down there. So, like Michelle was saying, there's, we all kind of know each other. <laughs> And have worked with each other um, in different circumstances at different times. Yeah, and um, I was going to say that, Peter, rather than imagining a conspiracy in terms of who was invited, initially it was conceived that we were inviting like vendors, um, one vendor of each format. So, um, the management and ingest, and then dealing with our wonderful digital file um, problem. So, I mean, reaching out to the community is absolutely, you know something that I would recommend and, and I think anyone here would, would certainly sit down and talk. I would say a big part of our bigger mission with the Studs Archive is to use that as a way to wake up the, the larger organization to the value of its own history. That's just the tip of the iceberg for WFMT and WTTW and further create more discussion about the fact that the work being made now hopefully will be valuable in 20 or 40 or 50 years in the future. Um, and if it's not, then something's wrong there, because if the work isn't, isn't, isn't being made to, of the quality to, to, or, the, or the depth and the, the interrogation of the state of the world today. Uh, but I think we've seen some, some shift with people in the organization who found the idea of archives completely marginal to now seeing it as much more central to the mission of the organization, down to even the location of the archives, which, have, which are now in a very prominent place in the building. It's one of the first things you see when you come in the building. Uh, which was uh, very different from what it would have been in years past, where it would have been hidden in the most remote corner of the basement. Um, so, but it's Only a work in progress. Only the TV is hidden in the basement. <laughs> so just add to that, too, like we're here for you to talk through these workflows because it really does depend on what kind of medium you're working with. And it is a, a large community effort, I think, to figure out how to deal with the physical objects themselves, establish a digital asset management system, and then go through all these processes like Sarah was describing to catalog metadata, make all of this information available, and then the real terrifying task of like maintaining and storing those digital assets once they're created, which is a whole other kind of two-hour conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and if we don't know the answer, we'll send, you know, like I send people to them all the time and they, they do the same thing. Right. I think one of the interesting things that runs across our organizations is that when we do work, let's say, as vendors, which we do as a not-for-profit um, to make money, we work with sometimes corporate clients to transfer their materials and things like that, but we always see it as an an underlying educational mission mm -hmm. that there is great importance to all of these materials. So if we transfer someone's home movie, we want to talk to them about how they can safely care and store for that film and not just hand them off a digital file, that we see all of those relationships and like this relationship that we're all forming here tonight as part of a greater community effort to really raise awareness around how important this material is mm -hmm. and how it's dying and we need mm -hmm. to do something about it now. Yeah, and that attitude you, you talked about, about how, oh, everything's available, it's all in the cloud, is really very, very dangerous because the, the amount of work it takes to get that content from your tapes, from your, from your films, from whatever, to being on the cloud is a huge, huge amount of work. Um, and money. And money, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Um, in a technical way of dubbing, and transferring the video to uh, being digitized, have you found a better application that works than others, um, software that you use to transfer? In particular, I'm thinking of 3 4 image. So the, uh, the software that you use for transfer? Um, a lot of people use Blackmagic because it's um, sort of affordable um, and simple. Some people capture using um, editing software like Final Cut Pro or Adobe Premiere um, with some kind of analog. You're going to need an analog to digital converter in between. I mean, we have a fairly sophisticated and complicated system um, called Cinedec that can transfer four tapes at once um, in, in real time that isn't really something that an individual would purchase for themselves. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, ha um. Plus it preserves the video quality. 
that. Right. I mean, you, you ideally would want to have a time-based corrector to stabilize the signal. You might not be able to get a good transfer of a U-matic without a, a time-based corrector. Other issues is that at this point, U-matics, a lot of the time, they're not going to be, they're not going to play when you try to play them, and you may need to do, to conserve the tape by um, basically the magnetic particles are coming off, and um, what you can do to, to get a good play out of it is you can bake it, literally. We have a Fuji hydrator that you put tapes in. You have to disassemble the cassette, take the tape out, put it in a Fuji dehydrator for like 48 hours, and it um, removes the humidity and sort of just like allows it to play without sort of gumming up the machine. Um, so measures like that are all things you, you might need to be thinking about if you're trying to transfer umatic tapes. Preferred um, climate control for tapes. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, there's not much you can do to extend the life of the tapes. So um, ideally, you would the, the lower the humidity, the better, and the more stable the temperature and humidity, the better. So I would, uh, rather than shooting for a particular temperature, I would mainly aim for stability and not put them somewhere where it's going to be hot in the summer and cold in the winter. Um, but ultimately, you know, whether they're at... 65 or 75 isn't going to really extend their life much, if at all. That's a good question for both. I mean, for film, it's completely yeah. different. Right, for Michelle yeah. and for, for Allison and Tony. I mean, for film, there are different standards for us as archivists. We try to keep materials, again, as stable as possible, between 50 and 60 degrees at 30% humidity. But, you know, if we're dealing with nitrate materials, that's a different story. So different kinds of film stocks require different kinds of storage methodologies. But... Uh, I would say for those of you who are archiving at home and preserving your own materials, cool, dark place with as stable a temperature and humidity as possible to just reiterate really what Sarah had to say. And, with and for our mag mag magnetic media, it's the same thing. We also have a food dehydrator that's very common or a convection oven, and we we don't have to take them out of the carrier, oh, no. which is, which is a, a little better, but it's, it's the same thing. It's, you know, cool and constant, low humidity, um, or constant and not 90 degrees. Um, but so, yeah, it's, it's very similar. Yes, sir. Digital file formats. Um, I think the general consensus is that uncompressed is the way to go at this point and to use either an AVI wrapper or an MOV wrapper, depending on whether you're Mac or PC based, um, for the archival format. And then you'll probably use something else to, for the access file online. I don't know if you guys. Yep. It's, it's sort of something that was definitely contested 10 years ago. Everyone talked about it at every conference. And I think now it, we're all set that we just don't compress. Any media. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which, which raises, again, an issue of storage and the, the enormous cost that goes into the hard drives that are required to store this material. So for us, you know, a safe archival standard is to store things duplicated three times, three different locations, and then we utilize a service called Digital Bedrock that is, you know, backing up our material on LTO tape. Um, but all of that is extraordinarily expensive. So once you create that uncompressed file and then you're, you know, quick time MOV access, you need to figure out how to take care of them for the next, you know. So you're just using external hard drives for everything? Are you using the cloud for storage at all? Many drives and then LTO tape. Uh, we are using LTO tape, a server, and then we use the cloud just for access copies. Yeah, same, several drives. Yeah, the I mean, in general, the cloud isn't really an appropriate place to store your masters. I think the cloud is a place where you can access content easily from many locations, but we really don't want to access our masters. We want them to be untouched. So um, it's a great way to share stuff, but not a great way to, to store permanent things. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Just while we're on this topic, would you be able to share some like, kind of basic best practices for people that have digital files, whether it's analog transfers or really digital. As far as like how many copies, what um, you know, what medium to store it all. Best practices for two is good, three is better in terms of copies, and keep them in different locations. And you've got to check them a lot. You've got to plug them in and make sure the files are still 
there and that the drive still works and you got to replace the drive the moment it seems like it's a fa there's anything off about it. Any kind of RAID or shield magnetic recording type of setup is also good because if one goes down, the media is a little bit better to be reconstructed. Also, on the point of migration, um, when you're doing that check, running a, uh, a, a tool that does check the, the file integrity and the digital health, um, because that right away, um, and using MD5 checksums, you know, all of the, and that's pretty standard across any, like, media or any digital media um, but yeah uh, and I think it's like every at least every five years if not sooner three to five years to migrate to a different hard drive or a server if you've got access to an LTO setup because you know you and a bunch of your buddies are getting together and and are using you know favors that's also good but it's also very expensive but definitely migration not um, you know there are certain there's like glacier storage for Amazon which isn't necessarily for constant retrieval and access um, I, I know other organizations use them I personally haven't um, but those may be certain options um, but definitely for a, a small local, exactly what Sarah said. Yeah, some service like Amazon Glacier is good to look into for an individual, I think, because you don't probably have that much content. Um, it's basically it's pretty unaffordable for a large yes. archive, but for someone uh, on an individual scale, it's probably pretty affordable and a good way to have peace of mind that there's additional backups that aren't in your city or whatever. One more question. Um, so in regards to uh, especially the audio world, um, for your uh, straight transfers versus the copies that are going out to people, are you doing much as far as restoration goes beyond the archive vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, compensating for um, fluctuations in tape speed or noise reduction, any of this? Or the copies are going out to the world? Uh, no, we mostly deal with preservation copies, right? And then typically the stuff that's going out, at least in a licensing capacity, um, we haven't run into it had been a request for a, a bad file. Um, so in that case, we would either leverage our in-house um, en engineers to to try and, and apply some restoration, or we would, you know, work with the the person who's interested in licensing and and see what we can do is in terms of price, you know, and if there was like work that they had to do to make it um, kind of up to their standards, um, if it weren't. But thankfully, we haven't had to cross that bridge. Um, now we're getting into the harder tapes um, that are having to be baked for quite a bit of time, which is we're happening. That's happening with the studs and the WFMT tapes. Um, so I imagine that's going to come up in the later. Batches, but for right now, what we have digitized, we've been pretty lucky in the in, in what's been requested. Oh, it's the Midwest Archives Conference, and you can it, they have an acronym of MAC. So if if you um, and check it's that in out. March, it's uh, it's the third week of March. And where is it going to be? It's here in Chicago, uh, Sheridan Grand Hotel. Thank you. And prices go up on Friday. So yes, if, um, <laughs> and there's a really <laughs> and there's a great uh, reception that's going to be held at the Museum of Contemporary Art. All right, we're going to wrap things up. I want to go around the table and ask everybody what, uh, first of all, what uh, major projects the, your organizations have coming up, and then what's your wish? What's on your wish list for the next couple of years in terms of infrastructure or uh, donations or anything else? Donations, <laughs> grants, <laughs> uh, people who need their videos. Uh, digitized primarily, of course, uh, documentary and nonfiction, which is what we can do and do do in Chicago as well or better than anybody at a price that works. So that's a, that's what we need to get done. And what we part of what we have to say to you is find us. We're, we're around mediaburn.org, and we'll figure out how to work with you. That's. That's the priority. And major projects coming up for you guys? Um, we're really excited to be starting a new um, project funded by the NEA that's an artist in residence project. Um, we're going to select two um, artists this year um, who are video producers who have significant collections of work on videotape that has not yet been preserved. And unlike what we normally do, they're not going to just sort of like drop off the tapes and be like, bye. Um, they're going to, um, we're going to, we have funding to provide them with a stipend and travel funds um, to work with us directly as we preserve their collection. So we'll be 
able to get the get information from them in terms of um, describing the material and um, thinking about how to present it and create public programming with their material. So we're really excited about that. Michelle. So for us, well, I mean, in terms of providing services to the public, we transfer all film formats, all gauges at standard and high definition and can handle really shrunken and damaged and problematic film. So that's a great way to use us as a resource. Um, and in terms of other projects we have coming up, I think our, our most exciting one is this international archival exchange. It's a cross-cultural um, creative project where we're working with the Siniscati Archive in Italy, and that premiere will be in July in Chicago. Great. So we are getting ready for the archive to launch on May 16th, which is Stud's birthday, so in three months, which has been the culmination of a lot of years of preparation. And say the podcast, Bug House Square, coming out at the end of the summer. And as far as hopes for the future, um, that also that, that this archive can help bring awareness to other other audio archives or archives, media archives, period. Um, I think a lot about the fact that a couple of Stud's close colleagues, uh, Lois Baum, who worked with him for many years, and Sidney Lewis, have both told stories of Stud's near the end of his life saying, you know, what's going to happen with my archive? Are these tapes going to be available? Will they be saved? Will they, will they be around in the future? And if a, you know, if a Pulitzer Prize winning, nationally known, you know, celebrated uh, figure had, has, had to worry about the future of, of an archive like this with these incredible figures, it, it's, a, it's a real wake-up call for, for archives that maybe don't have quite that, 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 that high visibility and how much harder it is. So, and as a culture that we need to be, uh, be a great point. shift yeah. thinking in many ways and as media organizations. And so the hope is that we can, among other things, become something of an advocacy organization for, for, for other archives too. And one way we can continue to do that is that we're um, assisting in the development of a speech-to-text open source um, software tool that is both for video and audio for transcription um, that can allow for great, greater freedom of who you want to have that service um, and then be able to have a graphical representation of, of music as well as, as text um, that's we're hoping will be fairly accurate. We'll need some input and some description, but um, that's kind of us giving back to the community and back to nonprofits because um, we see that as a real need. We've heard that, I'm sure, in, in, in many conferences. And it, that aids in description, that's vernacular, that hopefully the people that are looking for it can use um, if that, because that automatically gets you know, indexed and, and back into our database. So we're hoping to develop these tools um, to be able to, let, uh, to have other organizations you know, since we were able to shoulder those costs with our government funding, that you know we can make it available to others to, uh, and to help them and, and make those collections more discoverable. Okay, uh, the museum's closing its doors at eight. Uh, there's handout material uh, as you leave. All three groups have handout material, I believe. So uh, I'd like to thank Tom Weinberg, Sarah Chapman, uh, Michelle Pitts, Tony Macaluso, and Allison Shine Holmes for being here. Thanks so much. Thank you, John. You've done good.